Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Julia Borston. I'm CNBC's senior media and entertainment reporter, and I've had the honor of participating in the real-life Milken um, summits, global summits, over the past many years. Um, so it's really a, a, a thrill to be able to be here and have this conversation virtually, because I think this topic that we're addressing this afternoon is perhaps the most important one um, for, for companies to think about right now, and that is leadership in turbulent times. And one thing's for sure is that these are turbulent times and there is so little visibility right now for CEOs. You know, just yesterday we saw a, an uptick in COVID um, diagnoses, you know, the highest number we've seen yet. A lot of questions about what the future holds for the economy, for the health of the American people. And there's more responsibility than ever on CEOs um, to be good leaders, both for the companies that they're and the products that they're producing, as well as um, as their employee base. So I want to thank our three guests um, for being here today, and to quickly introduce them before we we get into the conversation. We have Carmine DeCivio, Global Chairman and CEO of EY, Barbara Humpton, President and CEO of Siemens Corporation, and Alfred Kelly, Junior Chairman and CEO of Visa. Thank you, all three. Um, I want to start on the topic of the challenge of balancing near-term, short-term, and long-term planning when you're in a time like this one and there is so much uncertainty. Um, and Barbara, I'm wondering if you could start us out as, and give us a little insight into how you think about leading both for the near-term and the long-term. Thank you, Julia, and, and thank you to the Milken Institute. This is a great opportunity for us to gather together and, and deal with these turbulent times. You know, Siemens is a company that is actually built to serve society. It's a company that for over 170 years has really applied engineering know-how to the critical technical challenges of the day. And we've built a long-term strategy today that focuses on the global megatrends, climate change, urbanization, those things which are just going to be driving changes in societies all around the globe. We bring know-how in electrification, automation, and digitalization. But here we are in this moment of tremendous disruption, and what we're finding is that the markets we're serving, be that energy where we've needed to work to keep the lights on for our customers and for all of us so we can do this and and healthcare where we've been mobilizing new treatments and facts not i hope we are working towards vaccines but also working on the um, antibody tests the the virus tests etc that are going to help us track and trace We've been mobilizing our capabilities that we have in building automation and in, in manufacturing, in, in the transition of transportation systems. I would say we've been a moment of response, moving to a moment of, of um, resilience, but now beginning to think about reinvention. So as we recover and as we move forward, we're able to get out of what I'll call the um, adrenaline rush of the initial um, you know, first wave of, of health crisis, second wave of economic crisis, third wave of societal disruption, and really take our eyes up and look at the horizon, thinking about how all of this fits in the know-how that we have and what we can bring to serve society as we build a more resilient future. Um, one thing that's been interesting is we've really seen an acceleration of certain technologies through this crisis. And it seems like whether it's artificial intelligence or machine learning, these technologies will be far more important on the other end of this. Carmine, can you give us a little bit of a sense of how you see um, the accelerated adoption of certain technologies and what that means for the services you're providing to your clients. Thanks, Julian. It's great to be here with everyone. So welcome, welcome to all. Um, I, uh, first of all, on technology, I mean, this has been, you know, all the trends that were, were happening before COVID-19 has just expedited everything. So, so when you look at transformation and what companies were trying to go through in terms of really transforming themselves to use technology more and more, that's all been expedited. You know, 94% of the Fortune 1000 companies have had their supply chains disrupted. And a lot of that has to do with using technology within their supply chain. So as we're moving along here, um, you know, there's more and more transformation going on. The companies that have been able to withstand COVID 
are moving very quickly in terms of their digital transformation. When we look at, you know, even technologies that are, that are these convening technologies, whether it's Zoom or Microsoft Teams at EY, we now have 300,000 people on Teams. We use the Microsoft Teams product and it's been absolutely fantastic in terms of communicating. Uh, we do every meeting with it. We do client meetings with it. And Zoom is a similar type, type situation that we're using today. So these technologies, convening technologies have been really skyrocketing. Technologies around, you know, how you interact with clients. Uh, for us, we've built a lot of technology in our audit practice and in our tax practice where we really have been able to do everything from home, seamless, uh, in terms of serving our clients. And as you really, you know, to Barbara's question before, we look at it as now, next, and beyond. And that's the way we're advising clients in terms of what do you have to do now to survive the COVID? What's next, next meeting in the, year, in the next six months to a year, and then what's longer term? And that's kind of the way we're looking at it. The first part was resiliency, making sure you have cash, liquidity, uh, making sure that you could actually operate using your technology. The next part's gonna be the six months or a year from now. How do you get people back in the office? How do you start operating in that kind of environment? And then the longer term, uh, which, which to me all has to do with being much more technology savvy, having your company really understand what, what, what are the future technologies, including some of the ones you mentioned in terms of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now, I want to um, delve into this idea of managing remotely, having a remote workforce more later. But first, Al, I'd love to get your thoughts on sort of your near-term, long-term planning in terms of the services you're offering to your customers, um, and particularly when it comes to helping small businesses, which um, is such an important business for you, uh, and, and helping those small businesses adapt in these times. Well, thank you, Julia. It's good to be with you, and it's great to be with both Barbara and Carmine, so thank you. Um, look, this small businesses are the engine for growth in the world, and they have been for years, and they will be going forward. They certainly have been hit very, very hard. Uh, I think particularly in the U.S., unfortunately, some of the early stimulus money required small businesses to keep certain people on payroll, which was a very, very difficult for that thing for them to do. And uh, I think now the government realizes that there's other things they need to do to make sure their business is viable as we start to see the economy restart. They, they need money to be able to pay for rent and insurance and things like that. We uh, just announced earlier this week a commitment that over the next three years that we, we're gonna digitally enable 50 million small businesses around the world. And we saw clear differences around the world depending upon the level of sophistication that small businesses had in terms of uh, e-commerce types of, of capability. Look, some, some of these small businesses, unfortunately, won't reopen, others will uh, emerge, but I'm a, a big believer that uh, these small businesses are extraordinarily important and they stem from a great entrepreneurial spirit that exists around the, around the world. And many of these people are, are very resilient. They, they garner, if they have a good, good product and a good service, they garner uh, tremendous uh, loyalty from, from people, you know, places like restaurants and florists, et cetera, tend to have followings. And uh, it's people are, are rooting for them and want them to, uh, to reopen. So we will be spending an enormous amount of time helping small businesses get back going as we're starting to see countries and states and cities reopen and restart around the world, Julia. Now, um, and sort of looking beyond small businesses, obviously the, the services you provide to those small businesses are so crucial, especially right now and in helping them make that leap to digital if they're not already there. Um, for your business, as you look big picture, have you been accelerating initiatives or moving in different directions because the world has changed um, as it has? On a number of fronts, but I'll, I'll highlight maybe in the interest of time, one uh, big one that I think is interesting, which is uh, the push towards contactless payments. Uh, anybody in this audience who's listening that's in the U.S. might say, wow, I, I don't see a lot of contactless. Well, the reality is the U.S. is the furthest behind in the world in terms of contactless payments. But there are uh, dozens and dozens of country, countries around the world where more than 50 percent of face to face transactions are on contactless. And the reality is that one of the things we've learned in, in COVID and a lot of people believe is that currency carries germs and it exchanges hands multiple times during the, the course of a day. 
And I'm sure many of uh, us have seen signs at, at merchants saying, I'll only take credit cards because they don't want to actually deal with the exchange of cash and expose their workers to it. One of the big things we had to do, though, is that many countries around the world have a cap on how high a transaction can be in order to accept it for contactless. And we worked with uh, almost 50 governments around the world in the first couple of weeks of COVID to get those floors raised up. And as a result, we were able to allow many, many more, millions of more transactions to actually be done in a, in a contactless mode. So I think the contactless world will continue to uh, accelerate because of COVID. And even here in the US, Julia, uh, the reality is by the end of this year, we'll have about 300 million of the credit cards, uh, Visa credit cards will be enabled for contactless. Over 80% of the merchants already have terminals that are, are plumbed to be able to accept contactless. We're in the mid single digits uh, in terms of uh, acceptance, but it's, it's gonna start to take off over the next uh, number of months and, even, and, and, and it will become a big deal in the US over the next couple of years. Interesting. Um, so um, just to return to this question of sort of managing people in these times, you know, all three of you are not just trying to run your companies, but you're dealing with work, a workforce that's all at home um, and all dealing with different challenges. Um, Carmine mentioned the sort of the value found in Teams and in Zoom and these new digital tools. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you've approached leading uh, leading your teams in these times and where you see opportunity to perhaps you know stick with some of these practices you found while working from home for over the long term. Um, Barbara, do you want to start us off here? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And and it's interesting because I, I listened to Al's uh, podcast with Mike and heard Al say, you know, in the last three months we've seen probably five or six years worth of advancement. I think this is very true. Um, right now, we have probably, call it 60% of our people working from home because they're working in jobs that are digital and, and can be managed that way. A good 40% of the workforce is in factories or you know, working at utilities, um, helping in hospitals, et cetera. So it's a real mix. And, and what we've discovered is that for teams that go virtual, it really is good for everyone to go virtual if possible. Um, the, there's something about putting everybody on an equal footing. It's not like there are a couple of special people in the office and then everyone else gets dialed in as needed. It's, it's a great equalizer where we can be directly in touch with each other at any time. But we'll be keeping aspects of that and, and we've got managers who are learning how to how to really embrace that and, and make that work. What's been fascinating is to see the number of things we can now do that were never possible before. I mean, 10 years ago, if you had told me you could take virtual reality glasses into a power plant and with a couple of really smart technicians on the ground, be able to loop in an expert somewhere in the world and, and actually take care of all the maintenance things that used to be done by a very large team actually located in that power plant. It, it's been a game changer. I, we've all heard the great stories of telemedicine, et cetera. I think as we've discovered ways to reach our end customers through these tools, we're asking ourselves not so much, how do we get the old equivalent of some physical path practice? We're now starting to think about what are the things that are possible now that simply weren't even something we could imagine previously? But so, and before I go to Carmen and Al, how much of this do you want to keep? How much are you going to be getting rid of office space because you don't need it anymore? Or do you think of this weird period we're in now as, this, as, a, as a temporary state? I think this is a new way that we move forward. Uh, we just had a global conversation last week, and you can imagine in cultures all around the world, there are different practices, but I think what we're gonna find is that if we can give leaders a framework that says, hey, here's a great way to use digital, here's an appropriate way to use buildings when they're needed as special areas for convening. You know, There are times we will want to bring people together but, but let's move on from the day and age of all of our people sitting in front of us, uh, you know, working a, a set number of hours in a shift. Let's, let's embrace this new ability to be virtual network more effectively 
and, and accomplish more. Interesting. What, Carmine, um, your average employee age is 27 and a half years old. How does that change things when you have such a young workforce? Do people want to be in the office more? I thought you were going to ask me, do I feel old, which I do, but uh, no. So, Julia, we, um, I, I, I'll tell you, some of this, it depends on where, where you start out. So we had probably about 25% of our people working from home before COVID. And so, so now in the U.S., we, I think we have 99% of our people working from home. And to Barbara's point before, you know, we actually had a long conversation today of our leadership group on where do we want to end up here in office space and so forth. And we're, we're, not, we're not there on, the, on this taking over everything and everything becoming work from home. I mean, we really believe in a much more of a hybrid model. A lot of it has to do around our culture. Uh, we really, you know, we love our culture and it's a very much a people culture and so forth. So we, we don't want to lose that culture. So we do think offices are going to be utilized a bit differently going forward. They're going to be convening areas and so forth versus just you go and you sit in a cubicle or in some kind of space, but, but we're very careful on this and we want to be very careful as we go forward. In terms of the age, it is interesting. So I've been on a lot of these Zoom calls and, and, um, and we've done a lot of surveys ourselves and surveys for clients. And the working from home uh, scenario, uh, for the most part, is much more comfortable for people, believe it or not, who are actually older, 45 and older, uh, people are much more comfortable working from home. And most of that is because they have a business network already. They have a lot of relationships already. And so therefore seeing people on video that they know already is, is pretty comfortable and it's fine probably for a period of time. Um, for younger people in their twenties and thirties that are truly interested in building a career. Now that's very different than a young person who just has a job to have a job, but are truly interested in building a career they want human interaction. They want to be able to build that network and so forth. And some people would say you could build a network virtually. Um, I think at least what the surveys tell us is that you have to have some real physical interaction. You have to be at places with people and so forth to really start building that, that kind of network. So we found an age discrepancy in terms of what's comfortable and what's not, at least for the longer term. So we believe more in a hybrid in, in general, not, not so much a big move of the pendulum. Now, I've seen the statistic that for EY, $1 billion worth of air travel amounts to 85% of your carbon footprint normally. When you look at that cost and then the environmental cost, and you look at the fact that no one's, or very few people are flying anywhere right now, what does that do for your strategy going forward in terms yeah, of so actually flying people around? Yeah, so, so that's actually, that, that's a great question. Uh, this is another area where, you know, we spend you know, over a billion dollars in air travel. That's what we spent last year. We certainly do not want to go back up to over a billion dollars in air travel. Um, you know, so in a way, what we're looking at is a reset. Um, but that number also isn't going to be zero or something really low because we do want to be out there physically with our clients. So we were talking today in terms of if we can get that number in a normal time and we can reduce that by 30 percent or you know, a third or so, we feel that that's probably a much better place to be. I really do think you know when, when you're in our business and you're dealing with clients and let's say you're on a client pitch, um, what's going to happen once the danger, you know, in terms of the virus is over, what's going to happen is if we're competing against two other firms and we're going to compete with Al and we're doing every, I mean, we're going to pitch something to Al or, or to Barbara and we're going to be like, okay, well, Al, let's do it virtually and so forth. And uh, now a competitor is going to go and have dinner with Al the night before you know, then we're going to be like, wait a second, we're going to have to have dinner the night before. So unless, unless like all that stops, little by little, I think we will build up back into some air travel, but hopefully it will never be where it was before, where we're jumping on planes for one hour meetings and it really doesn't make sense. Now, Al, I know over half of your employees are millennials, I believe. And you 52%. also have very, sorry, 52%. Yep. And then also big costs associated with air travel. How is your workforce adapted and what does it look like a year from now? Or hopefully we're out of this a year from now. Well, first of all, uh, you know, we're a very global company. We operate in every country and territory in the world, except the five the U.S. government has sanctions against where we can't be. We have 97% of our employees working from home. Uh, we are in a technical and services business. And I have to say that 
after we got past through the first couple of weeks, uh, the productivity in the company has gone up. And um, we have developed new and, and interesting ways to all stay in contact with, with one another. After we're done today, I will shoot uh, my 15th uh, vi weekly video that it goes globally to em employees. And employees have had a, a look into my life uh, in ways that they never have. Uh, we are doing, uh, I made the mis maybe they made the mistake in my 10th week video to say that if people have happy hours or events, I'm happy to join them. And I'm now doing six to eight happy hours uh, a week. In fact, I did a disco party with our Europe office uh, about uh, five or six hours ago. Uh, they're into disco in Europe. I think that's the third one I've done. <laughs> but we are sharing stories about favorite pets, favorite vacations, favorite recipes on our uh, on our in, in, intranet in, internally. Uh, we are seeing uh, pe people really, really like this. I have to admit, I like it. Um, I do. I do think there there are some things that worry me. I worry about new employees. I worry about culture. I worry about creativity, and I worry about inclusion. Uh, in terms of a world where you'd, you'd go to 100% work from home. But I, we weren't as high as Carmine, but we probably had 10% of people working from home before this. I would expect that, uh, I, I, I don't know, I think at least a third of our workforce will be at home. I'm in no rush to bring people back. I, it was easy to shut it down because you just tell people to work from home. Coming back is a lot harder. Uh, and what we have said is that uh, first of all, no employee, uh, it's employee choice whether they want to come back before the end of the year when, when we decide to open an office. And we only have about seven of our 130 offices open right now. Uh, we're only going to bring that back 10% of people first, then 25%, and then 50%. We have no plans to go greater than 50%. We actually didn't have a positive COVID test for seven weeks. Last week, we had five amongst the 3% of people that are at work. Uh, so now we have 150 people quarantined and we had to have a whole bunch of people. These are essential workers that needed to be in the office. We had to scramble last week and do heroic, not me, me, a number of people did heroic work to get 150 people set up at home who had been coming to the office doing essential jobs, either in technology or in, in client support. So we're going to be, we're going to be very slow to come back. I also b believe Julia that uh, everybody at Visa is working ho at home. I made a commitment in the first week that I wouldn't lay anybody off because of, of COVID this year. And I believe that we should allow people to come back to work who need to get back to work in order to earn a paycheck. With 44 million people unemployed, I don't need visa employees uh, crowding up mass transit or crowding up elevators, et cetera. I think we should be on the more on the tail end of going back uh, because frankly, it's in our best interest to get as many of those 44 million people back to work, back to having a paycheck, back to being able to get back into the economy and spend. Um, I think everybody's gonna be a bit different. I do think there's a new norm. Um, how much each of each company has in terms of uh, employees staying working from home, I think virtually all of them are gonna have many more than they had pre-COVID. It's, it's a matter of how. And I do think offices will change. Offices will be touch down locations. There'll be places to meet clients. There'll be places to do innovation, creativity, brainstorming sessions. There'll be places to do new employee orientation and uh, those kinds of things. So offices aren't going to go away, but I, I, uh, I do think they're going to change. You know, for the, the reality is that any CEO who felt that working from home just was a terrible thing and fought it, you know, is defenseless now uh, because for 12 to 15 or 16 weeks, depending upon the company, you've seen your company function and that argument is out the door. So, uh, but that said, Carmine's right. If, you, if you're 27 and you're living in a 500 square foot studio, you're going crazy and you want to get back, you want to get back to an office. So um, we'll, we'll have to see how this all, all works out, but I think we're all going to have to be more flexible. We're all going to want to be more flexible in the war for talent we're going to have to be more flexible uh, because you could lose people if you don't offer that flexibility. And many of your uh, competitors who could hire your talent do offer that flexibility. 
Um, yeah, Al, you, there's one thing you left yeah. off of your list of, of the office of the future, a haven for parents of young children. Yes. Who may not be in school, right? So Barbara, that imagine, leads to my, sorry, go ahead. I was Al. gonna say one thing. I, I can only imagine the arguments in households where both parents have jobs and they have two or three young kids and they're fighting over who has to take them because what meeting's important. I, I feel terribly for those folks. But so Al, that actually, that leads right to my next question. You mentioned the word equity. There have been a number of studies um, and new statistics out about how there is a big risk that COVID and the stay at home, work from home orders um, are gonna negatively impact women and are gonna hold women back in the progression of their careers because you know when kids you know it, when kids don't go back to school in the fall and parents need to make decisions um, about what to do there is a higher possibility that that women will decide not you know to quit their jobs or it's not worth it financially so there's this whole question of what's going to happen in terms of equity and i'm wondering how the three of you think about equity in the workforce now from a gender perspective um, with all the with the risk that the gender gap will be exacerbated um, or perpetuated as a result of of COVID. Yeah. Well, I think we've all identified potential risks, um, and that the one you're you're talking about it would be a, a devastating risk. And uh, at least from my perspective, we'll, we would do everything we can to ensure that uh, that there's complete equity. It's you know it's part of who we are as a company that every everybody should be treated uh, equally. So it's, it's something among the, li I listed other things. There's other things we're all going to have to manage through that are risks. I mean, unfortunately, the world isn't one of these things where everything's perfect. So there's a lot of positives from work from home, but there are some ch challenges and some risks. Yeah. And, and as you mentioned, though, the, as my husband and I are both working with two, two little boys at home, um, definitely a, a complicated juggle at times. Um, and, and it seems like, it, it, you know, Al, you've sort of referenced a lot of sort of, you've had to be very empathetic on a very personal level as you've attended the disco parties in Europe, which is have a <laughs> sense of sort of personal connection. Um, Carmine, what are you, how are you approaching this issue to think about equity in the workforce now? And then also as you start to hire again. Yeah, so, so we're, we're, We've been on the forefront of equity and inclusiveness, in particular around gender, for a long time. And uh, you know, I have a third of my global board are women, and uh, you know, a third of our partners are women. So you know, it is it is going to be an issue, though, at home. I have to tell you that this concept. I mean, it's an easy solution to this this issue, and that is kids need to be back in school in the fall. But that's that's very hopeful, uh, and we'll see what happens. But I do think, you know, today, and again, this depends on where you start, um, dual careers are everywhere. There is child care. Uh, we know many people who have child care in the home, even today. Um, I do think going into this, uh, if there is a second wave, I mean, I think people can plan for it better than what we did in the first wave, which most people didn't plan for it at all. So I think you can plan for child care in the home or different ways of having child care, uh, which will be helpful. But in terms of equity overall, um, I, I do think this is going to be important. It's going to be important. This is why I talk about the pendulum and the pendulum. I don't think we want it to swing all the way one way um, because it, it is important that, that people are able to work, that there is no biases. Uh, and this is not just gender. This is across the board. Uh, and we should get into a conversation around what's happening in terms of the racial situation. But but these are all incredibly important. And today, they're more important than ever because, as to Al's point earlier and Barbara's point, everyone needs talent. And talent is diverse. And we all want diverse talent. And, and therefore, we're going to be competing with this. And unless you have equity across the board in any situation, you're going to lose. Um, and Barbara, I, I do want to return to this issue of um, racial inequalities and the the protests and everything going on right now about that. But first, Barbara, I'd love to get you to finish your thought on the issue of of gender um, gender issues coming out of COVID in particular. I think this is something we're going to have to be very overt. We have to be intentional about this, right? We got to measure and you know take some data points to make sure that our actions really line up with our goals here. We're all striving to be more equitable. And I think it's going to be really easy to make decisions, little decisions along the way. I'll give you an example. 
what happens when it's time for performance evaluation? And now we've all seen Al Kelly dancing, you know, at his disco parties, right? Is that going to change what, what we know about Al at home? Is that going to change our opinion about how he's been performing on the job? I think it's something real that we have to acknowledge, prepare for, uh, be conscious of as we go into, say, you know, year-end performance evaluations. And then, and then, by the way, in our work, we have lots of men who are choosing to be uh, very engaged caregivers. So I realize this is not just a question for women. This is a question for parents who want to spend quality time with their children, but still want to be fully engaged in the workforce. I'm with Carmine. I think that I think that there's a lot of ingenuity out there. We're going to find some solutions where you know maybe neighborhoods, friends are going to come together and find some joint solutions that are going to be you know less risk than opening up schools completely and and are going to enable people to be back at work. Um, I want to remind everyone to please start sending in your questions because I'm going to continue a little bit here. With my questions, but I would love to involve more questions from the attendees. So please do send in your questions now. Um, so we're to return to the, the conversation about the need for inclusivity. The, the whole country, the business world has really been, um, been stopped in its tracks by the uh, uh, civil unrest, uh, by the you know, protests, and the real demand for change when it comes to the topic of, of racial inequality. And this is something that a lot of um, brands and, and CEOs have taken a stand on and pledged to make changes on. And there's also sort of a, a big question about how the, there's huge financial value to be gained in having a much more diverse workforce. Um, I'm curious to know how each of you is approaching this, this question and this challenge um, in a time where corporate America, the leadership of corporate America is largely white. Um, Barbara, you're, you're nodding here. Do you wanna start off? I, I'm happy to. The, the leadership team here at Siemens US decided that this was something for which we needed to speak with one voice. Um, in early days, we communicated to our entire workforce um, in a joint letter signed by all of us, reiterating our commitment and, and actually pledging to action. I mean, this is, this is a moment where words are important. Uh, but our actions matter much more. Now, what happens then, right? How do we keep momentum going? I, it's one thing for our employees to know what we stand for and, and to know that we support them as they stand for these things which are core values to our corporation. It's another thing to actually start, you know, rolling the actions out more rapidly. What I've chosen to do, I'll just share this with the whole audience, what I've chosen to do is look at this both from a personal perspective as well as the role I play in the corporation. I think this is a moment when each of us as leaders needs to be thinking about how our own personal perspectives and actions can help move this societal issue. And so my personal action plan really deals with me becoming better educated. One of the things I've scheduled is instead of um, webcasts where we say to employees, ask me anything, I've scheduled a bunch of one-on-one -on -one phone calls with people who have clearly shown through our internal social engagement that, that they're interested in this topic. And I'm calling these meetings, tell me anything. Because I think now is a moment when I need to listen very closely. Now, when it comes to my actions as a business leader, the two biggest deals I see are really championing changes in our talent development so that we have a real pipeline of diverse talent coming up through the senior ranks. And then secondly, being personally engaged in our supply chain management when it comes to networking with minority businesses, when it comes to recognizing their contributions, and really increasing the effectiveness of those businesses in the overall Siemens network. Um, now, Al, I want you to jump in here because I know you've um, made a commitment of donating hundreds of millions of dollars to small and micro businesses. Um, with particular focus on economic development. So I'm, I'm wondering how you're thinking about making inclusivity part of the business school as well as your own process internally with your employees. So we have done that, but in, the, in, in full disclosure, we, that's something we did.
did bef before what uh, what happened to George Floyd and the aftermath of of that. And our initiative, that initiative is a global initiative. I mean, there's a there's a lot of women uh, owned firms in particular around the world that need to be uplifted. Uh, the amount of capital available to women versus men is 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 terribly ins insufficient. So there's a lot of work to do there. I, I think the United States has a particular issue uh, with regard to uh, black people, and it's been going on for 400 years. It must stop. Uh, enough is en enough is enough. And I do think that it fe it feels like this is an inflection point. You know, sometimes these news things become news cycles and and stopped after 48 hours. This can't be a news cycle. And, and some of the protesters have helped us make sure it's not, a, not just a news cycle. Our employees are making sure that it's not just a, a news cycle. They're stepping up and they're talking to us. I probably have gotten, in my four years as CEO, I would say without question, I've heard from more employees on this subject, probably a thousand emails in the last three weeks, all of which I answer. It makes for some long Saturdays in terms of reading and answering, but I'll, I'll answer every single w one of them. Um, I believe that uh, there's a number of things we need to do. You know, we started a series of something called race talks, uh, and we we had over uh, 2,500 U.S. employees last Friday uh, listen into a guest speaker to talk about the history of slavery. Um, you know, we all took American history, but uh, you know, we forget, and, and it's unclear how much of that uh, was really out there. And I think that people need to, some of this history is very, very important. I, I have not talked to a single black employee who has not experienced some uh, discrimination. Sometimes it's subtle, you know, people kind of moving away from them when they get on an elevator or walking to the other side of the street when they're walking down the street. And some of it not so subtle, being harassed by a security person in a, in a store or being harassed by an officer. And obviously some of it just horrendous when people that we trust could take to killing somebody because of the color of their skin. We, we, we're not, you're not breathing if you don't find this utterly unacceptable. And we have to be very clear that black lives matter and we all have to do our part. So in addition to dialogue and doing things like matching gifts, I wanted to do something sustaining, strategic, and leaning in. So we announced a scholarship program uh, for the next five years. I hope it goes on past that, where we'll give uh, uh, money to uh, uh, black students who are seniors in high school. We'll work with them throughout college. And if they do their part, they'll have a guaranteed job at Visa uh, at the end of their, their four years of college. And, I'm extremely excited about the prospect of having year after year after year, young black people walk into the halls of Visa or the virtual halls of Visa to our earlier discussion and, and become uh, uh, a pipeline that will, in essence, make this representation issue go away. Because if we can, if we can plant many, many more seeds and, and nourish those seeds, which is very important. It's not just getting people in the door, it's coaching them, it's mentoring them, it's being there for them, that uh, we, should see, we, we should see many more people rise, rise up. That, that said, uh, we have to do better in terms of representation of senior people even today. And you know, diversity and inclusion, and I think inclusion is an extremely important aspect of this, is very important for us at Visa, it's a journey. We've made some progress. The progress we've made is insufficient, uh, and we're we're redoubling our efforts. And I think that the horrendous death of George Floyd is going to go down as having sparked something that generates some real and I hope quite sustaining change with regard to racism and social injustice in America. Fantastic. Now, uh, Carmine, you want to weigh in here? Yes, I do. Um, thanks. And, and I, I generally agree with everything that Alan and Barbara have said, and we've done similar type things. This is a time of action, not just words. So at the beginning, everyone put out statements and so forth, and, and I did and we did as well. But it really does come down to action. And for us, um, we've had a lot of internal conversations from our black senior people, our black partners, our black employees. And uh, one of the interesting conversations, we're very you know, progressive in terms of DNI, DNI globally, and so forth, and we have a lot of resources against it. Obviously, we're a big people business, so it's important. But you know, 
we probably have weighted much more of our resources towards gender and towards sexual preference than we have towards blacks in particular in the US. And that's something that we've had a lot of conversations around and we're gonna have to be more laser focused on people of color uh, around the world. For us, this is a global issue now, not just a US issue. Where there's been demonstrations in London, Australia and everywhere else. So we have to be more intentional to use Barbara's words. And, and, and basically, we are doing a lot in terms of education. For us, it's a supply issue. We have to get more and more people of color that are qualified, that are CPAs, that are lawyers, that are qualified to work at EY. So we are donating to some of the schools, historically black colleges and so forth, to produce those programs so we can increase the supply. Then in terms of development, we have a, our top 500 roles at EY globally. We actually have a whole process around succession and succession slates. And each su succession slate for each role has between four and seven names. And years ago, five, six years ago, we made sure that each slate had two women on it. Uh, that, and when I say focus on gender, this is the focus. We call it two in the pool. Um, so now we're having conversations around, you know, should in particular in the U.S., but should these slates also have a person of color on it, or at least, or maybe two people of color? Is that going to be the way that we progress people, you know, up the organization uh, into senior management. The one thing that I would caution, Julia, on this, there've been a lot of companies out there that are putting out metrics and they're gonna double this percentage, you know, at this level. And the problem is they're working with the law of small numbers, you know, so they have five people and they're gonna have 10 people, you know, and it's a 100% increase, but, but that's not really gonna move the needle. Um, so I do caution when you read out there some of these people that are putting out these metrics and the metrics don't really don't really address the problem um so those are some of the things we're doing we're, we're very focused on this obviously our, uh, you know it's 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 uh something that uh, we need to do and we should be doing um but it's not easy and it's going to take some time because it is one of these things where, where the supply is so low for us yeah, it sounds like a lot of tough conversations and a need to turn inwards, um, which it can be challenging. Um, I want to bring in an audience question, attendee question here, um, because I, it ties into this. Uh, the question is, in the past few years, purpose-driven approaches have been a priority for many CEOs. Have recent events accelerated and or facilitated this movement for your company? For instance, environmental, social, and governance or ESG criteria. If you want, Julia, I could start on this. Sure. Um, whoever whoever I, wants I, to jump in first. I, I actually think the COVID situation and, and the racial situation have uh, are continuing to push on ESG. And uh, to me, the two, the two themes that are going to come out of this COVID uh, situation in particular and the racial situation, one is around sustainability. We talked a little bit about it before. Um, you know, even starting before COVID, uh, maybe a year ago or so, it was the first time I really saw U.S. companies really more focused on sustainability. It was like a switch went off. European companies, Barbara, were much more ahead on this. On this, but we have a chance for a reset on sustainability. You know, mine mine was a little example, but but all companies have a chance to really reset because carbon footprints have been lowered. I think they were lowered 17 percent in April. Um, so that's, that's going to, you know, the whole situation is going to force people and it's going to have people think about it more. And I think it's going to help the sustainability piece. The other piece is income inequality. And you could see it, COVID actually highlighted it. Uh, some of the protests, some of the things that are going on now also highlighted. But in, uh, in, during COVID, you know, m many of the people who, who got sick, who died around the world, and right now it's very true in Brazil, uh, we're, we're economically uh, lower, you know, in terms of their, their, their uh, living. So, so that's something that I think all companies are going to have to be focused on. Uh, it's going to have to move much faster. We're going to have to talk a lot more about wages and wage increase and minimum wages and so forth, because that's going to come out of this as well. So those are the two areas that I would say that, that are going to come out of this. And I think ESG, there are a lot of board members talking about it now, putting a lot of pressure on CEOs. Um, it will, I think it will expedite ESG uh, versus push it backwards. 
I, I couldn't agree more. And as I shared when we got started, um, Siemens is very much purpose driven. And during the COVID crisis, as it started, it was something that actually what turned into our greatest strength. Um, we had employees who their immediate question, once we were sure we had safety protocols and once we were sure the business was in good shape, the very next question was, how do we help? And, and I'll tell a story just to illustrate this, that early on, Georgia Tech contacted one of our leaders, Barry Powell in Atlanta, Georgia, and said, hey, we have a design, an idea for PPE, a face shield, and we need to take this to scale. Barry put his team to work on it, and in short order, they were producing 10,000 shields a week, and now they're producing 100,000 shields a week, delivering them to hospitals around the area. You know, having a real problem to solve and getting to work is, is one of those things that keeps, well, nothing makes an engineer happier, right, than, than that, and that reduces stress. And, and so here we sit in the middle of, you know, first response and then recovery. I like your, you know, the, the, the three stages you've laid out, Carmine, so, so compelling. Now that we're thinking about the longer term, this is a chance as we reset, as, as a nation, we spend a lot of money on infrastructure, we think, <laughs> as we, you know, get businesses started back up, if we can think long term about our sustainability goals, we have a chance to actually build forward, build a more, a, a more purposeful path forward. And, and actually, we're optimistic and pretty, pretty energized by the prospect of how this focus is going to turn on the afterburners for business. Um, there, these are great, uh, great questions and answers. I want to dig into some of these uh, other questions from attendees. One of them is, um, thus far, discussions on doing business during the pandemic have largely focused on helping companies survive. As the world changes to accept our new normal, how can companies thrive in the COVID-19 economic environment? Well, I think everybody's got to find what the new normal means for their particular company. Uh, I mean, there, for, for Visa, there are some very b big positives. $18 trillion last year was spent on cash and check by consumers to the degree people shun cash and check. That's a very, very good thing for us. Governments are increasingly looking to get more active in terms of having their various subsidy programs be done in a more digital fashion. That's very good for us. The fact that Carmine's not going to spend a billion dollars having people travel around the world is less good for us. Uh, the fact that more people will uh, be pushing to, to buy online and get comfortable buying online. We had 35 million people in April go online to buy that didn't previously have, have gone online. So all of those things are positive. So I think every, every CEO and their executive team has to be saying there are, there are positives that can come out of it. And I think everybody's got to try to figure out what those are. Carmine, you're nodding. You want to weigh in here? No, no I mean, I think Al said it well. I think Al said it well. Um, one of the other questions here is um, whether it is time for racial and gender quotas in corporate leadership. Man, I'll go back to Carmine's comment. I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that quotas get you there. Now, I think it's good to have goals. And then I think it's good to be honest with each other about where we are against those goals. I think what we really need to stay focused on is getting the right talent in the right place, but making sure that there are more people that we recognize as having the talent we need uh, for those key roles. And I mean, look around you to your left and your right. You'll be surprised at how well prepared people of color and women are for roles that previously may have been predominantly held by white men. Um, I, I think this, this segues to another question here, which is whether the crisis has affected your internship program. Speaking of pipeline, what advice would you give to recent upcoming college graduates looking to enter this very weird job, job market? So it's, well, I, I, go ahead, Carmine. No, go ahead, Al, you, you can go. Look, I, I feel for uh, college junior, seniors in particular, I mean, to miss out on graduation and potentially come into this job market is, uh, is brutal and timing in life can be horrible at times and great at times. Uh, we made a decision to continue with our intern 
internship program. We're doing it virtually. Uh, I think we're doing some neat things. We're making our Visa University available to continue to increase the learning of our interns. Uh, three times a week, we're having a senior person uh, spend time with the interns, telling them a little bit about their career and uh, and answer and what their job responsibilities and answer answer questions. Uh, so it's not ideal. I mean, we went through everything from uh, canceling it to canceling and it paying them. But we ultimately decided it was very important for them to have an experience to put on their resume because that's as important as as getting paid. It's going to be a little more difficult for us to evaluate. It's going to be a little more difficult for them to evaluate us. Uh, but we're doing uh, everything we can to uh, make the best of the, the situation. But I, I think we elected to proceed as uh, much as we could. Yeah, Julie, I, I'll, I'll jump in here. We also, we kept all our internships, uh, I think close to 20,000 internships around the globe. And, and so we kept them all. They are all virtual. They're, uh, they're five weeks and not 10 weeks. Um, we did not give, you know, some, some financial institutions actually told the kids that they have full-time offers right off the bat. We did not do that. Um, we will, you know, many of our interns do get full-time offers, but uh, we're going to do that at the end of the internship. I mean, we think this is incredibly important uh, to make sure that we maintain our internships and then all our new hires that usually start around September, we're, we're good, we're, they have jobs and so forth. We will cut elsewhere but we are not going to cut at those levels, which is very important to our future um, period. So, so you know, the, the, the virtual part of this is interesting. Um, people are doing really innovative things virtually around these internships. Um, I have uh, four kids who are, who are doing internships, and uh, some of the things that they're being asked and have to do and have to actually connect with other interns and other people are really pretty interesting. So we've also done... Every, all our learning events are all virtual through December 31. We've done a really good job at really making them virtual. There's a lot of creative people, and, and these kinds of things um, are helpful. You know, I want to jump in here, too, because, um, yes, we have interns. And, and I want to come back to the concept of can you create culture in this environment? And it's been amazing. We've got 50,000 people in all 50 states uh, here at Siemens USA. And, and so this idea that if we had interns come in, lots of times they were spending their days on the telephone, you know, in video teleconferences, you know, talking to people all across the country. And, and really the way we reach people is much more in how we care for each other, taking care of each other, showing interest, pulling people in, and, and then the, the new modes of communication that we've been using these last few years, digital and otherwise, I actually am thinking what's emerging is a kind of cool culture. A cool culture. Barbara, I have to tell you. Yeah. I was just going to say, Jane, one of the funniest comments was one of our senior partners, um, Mary Lloyd De La Rue, she's our head of assurance globally. She, uh, in one of our conversations, she said, can you fall in love via Zoom or via Teams? That's the question. Mm -hmm. And so, so mm -hmm. that got a lot of people thinking in terms of uh, young people and uh, and culture and, and that kind of thing. Uh, it's been interesting hearing all the ways we've talked about culture throughout this conversation. Just a final question, um, and I, this, we will end on this note. Attendee asks, a recent article published by McKinsey reported that minority-owned small businesses will be disproportionately affected by this crisis. How can large companies and their leader, leadership help alleviate this burden? Now, Al, I know you've worked, you're working on this. We are, and we're, we're going to do everything we, we can to try to help, help those, those businesses. And uh, we're still working on it specifically how. I think we can't cover the entire world, but I think we can help in various communities uh, where we can get a little bit of economies of scale and best practices to try to, uh, to help people. Um, Carmine or Barbara, want to weigh in on this last point? Well, let me make a comment. We'll pay our bills. Right. We're, we're going to be we are going to be stand up citizens in the business community and take care of those businesses who have stood by us as we've been growing and changing. And so I, I do think this is a moment of attention. I know that um, there's a real need to ensure that the government programs that were intended to support these businesses actually reach them. And to the extent we can be advocates for that, we will. This is a really critical point. Carmine? 
Yeah, no, I don't have a lot. I mean, we're helping, you know, medium sized to small businesses make sure that they get their government subsidy and so forth. So we're on this as well. And I agree with what Alan Barber said. Well, that's a, it's a really good point to end on. I, I, we've covered so much in this hour, culture, managing uh, people from afar, the transforming workforce, what, it, what, what the office of the future is going to look like, what the next generation of employees should look like, um, and really an emphasis on diversity and inclusion and the financial value that will come from that. And then also just the accelerating technologies, both that we're all using um, in our lives, but also that you're deploying to your customers, whether it's small businesses that you're bringing online or the use of, of AI. We didn't even get to talk about blockchain, Carmine. We'll have to do that <laughs> next time. Um, but really a, a fascinating time. Um, and, and you're all thinking so, uh, so deeply about all these issues. So I want to thank you, um, Barbara, Carmine, Al, for, for talking to us today and sharing your perspective. Really valuable conversation. Thank you. Nice to be with thank you. you. Thank you. Great seeing, great seeing everyone.